How much have you got there? Oh, let the sun shine in. Say, boys and girls, we try to let the sun shine in every afternoon at 3 o'clock on TX Television. This window will be occupied by T.J. Possum, Lord Grey Monkey, and Dillingham the Dinosaur. So be sure to look for us at 3, the Uncle Ellie Hughes Show. Face it with a grin. Open up your heart and let the sun shine in. Ellie Hughes had his beginning in the latter 40s. I had a program on KWTX radio at 6.50 in the morning. And uh, so every morning I wrote a script that had the sponsors involved in some dialogue. But then in the uh, early 50s, I went to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I had in mind I wanted to put Elihu on, the, on TV. And so I had a hat that I had used in going to Washington. We had a hearing there to uh, gain uh, television for Waco, and I was part of that hearing. So I bought this good felt hat to go to Washington. Well, I put the hat under a steam kettle and, and made it misshapen as much as I could. And I went to the University of Mexico and asked them if they could uh, give me some crepe hair, which they did. So I made mustache and sideburns uh, with the crepe hair that, that they showed me how to put together. They were very accommodating. When I was in Albuquerque, I had a ukulele and I, I learned these one or two songs to put on this television show and they were very simple chords and that's about all I could pick up because I never played a, a instrument but uh, the young artist there said uh, Ellie Hughes said I have a ukulele that was in my grandfather's attic and if if you would like to trade this battery operated little car I had a toy sponsor out there and he liked that toy it was a little remote control even back then he said, I'll trade this ukulele with you. And I said, you've got yourself a deal. And so we traded, and that's how Elihu got the ukulele that he carried throughout the years. Uh, but then when Waco came on with TV on Channel 10, of course, that was my hometown. And uh, I, um, I contacted uh, Mr. Buddy Bostick and said I had, had this show. And uh, I showed him a bit of it, and he said, we'll hire you. Now, Elihu came on TV without any set. And P.J. Possum, which was Elihu's sidekick, was only a possum and uh, hung P.J. on the back of this rocking chair. And he didn't say anything for a long while until I got someone to, to be P.J. And I found uh, uh, Dick Clayton in the film room and I asked him if he'd like to be on television and be P.J. Possum. He said yes and so there we went, and then we had a nice set that they produced for us. And uh, soon after, uh, Dick Clayton went to California with his own puppet show, and Bryce Armstrong was in the film room then. So I asked Bryce, how would you like to be P.J. Possum? And luckily for all of us, Bryce said yes. And he was a anchor, he was a center part of that show as long as it was on the air. And people just loved the character that he made P.J. Possum become. Since I was uh, doing the puppet, I wanted to do more at the station. I felt like I belonged there. I ended up working uh, in the film room, uh, which consisted of working with a telop machine. I am now so old that when I tell people I used a telop machine, they don't know what I'm talking about. The Broadcast Museum in Dallas has a telop machine, but nobody there knows how it works because that is in the dim, dark past. We're talking 50 some odd years ago. Uh, but uh, worked with slides and uh, 16 millimeter film and so on and so forth. It was not exciting work, but it uh, kept me at the station and kept me fed as it turned out. PJ was, when I came in, the puppet was already there. I took it over. To give you an idea, this is, uh, I believe this was PJ before I got there. How do you do? It's good to see you, kid. Want a possum grin? Possum grin consisted of, which Uncle Ellie Hugh then encouraged kids to slip in their pocket, and then when they needed a grin, they had it. We had the uh, possum grinners. We had an upstairs viewing room that had glass uh, along the entire wall to where the, the viewers could look down into the studio and watch the show. 
We called that the chicken roost. And we called the people up there chicken roosters. And then at one point in the show, we made chicken roosters into possum grinners. And we sang this song, which a friend of mine, uh, her name was uh, Nanine Lustig, Mrs. Joe Lustig, wrote this song for the show. Oh, if you want a possum grin, step right up and come right in. Put your finger on the PJ's chin and give yourself a possum grin. A possum grinner is a sunshine winner. Doesn't matter if you're just a beginner. Step right up and come right in and get yourself a possum grin. Delicious. Yay! Thank you, Uncle Algy. And the chicken roosters would line up in the studio and sometimes we would have 60 or 80 of them on a day. And and let me say this, which I, I'm very proud of, there was no racial discrimination. The African-American families understood that this show belonged to everybody. And they put their young people in that line as with, the, with everyone else. And no one complained about that. It just was done and was done easily and with ease and comfortably. So all of these little kids would come up and we would have them give their name on camera and of course that was a big deal for the families back at home. And then they would put their finger under PJ's chin and he would give them a possum grin. And then they would step off the stage and, and the next person would come up. But that was a, a part of the show. We had uh, serials like uh, we had Little Rascals and uh, other film that we used. And of course, Young Wes, Young Wes joined us uh, very soon at the beginning. And he was the, uh, the person that appealed to a broader age. And he did a great job in singing country songs and, and interchange with PJ and with Uncle Elihu. And Young West was a, a real uh, addition to that show. The TV station had been on the air, I guess, two or three months. And a friend of mine by the name of Hillary McDonald was working as a cameraman. And the summer before, my wife and, my, and her sister and myself, we did a radio show for KWTX for Buddy Bostic and in the summer. And the girls, it was the Diamond Twins, were Ramona and Winona. And I played the guitar and they, they sang. So from the way, way I've always understood this, Someone said something about having a, a guy come on the LEU show that would pick the guitar along with him and sing little songs and, and do uh, whatever might be necessary. And Hillary come down one afternoon to the shop and he said, Mr. Bostick wants to see you about doing this television show. So I think I went up the next day with a guitar and we sang a little song or two. And I did the show that afternoon and then and did it for three years running. One of the interesting things about this show is everybody assumes that we were scripted, we were not. Uh, we were formatted to the extent that Bob had a maybe five by seven sheet of paper tacked to the uh, inside of the porch uh, railing, which said, opening, uh, Wes sings, Popeye cartoon, uh, and just the basic format of what went where, which commercial, and so on and so forth. We went on at four o'clock in the afternoon, and generally somewhere around two or three, uh, we would kind of we would get together, and if, if we were going to do a little song together, and every once in a while we would do songs together, so we would get together and go over the song, or oh, maybe two or three times, just to make sure that that it, uh, we just did the really cold, you know. And uh, it worked out better that way. I do songs, we try to do, uh, uh, I know PJ still kids me about it today. We'd do uh, The Wayward Wind, which was a popular song at that time. And we tried to keep the songs within the, uh, within the context of a children's program something that the children could identify with and and still, you know, make it entertaining song. And sometimes that became a real chore. 
because of the, the popular songs, even of that day, were, were not very uh, appropriate, I guess you might, the word might be. At any rate, we would do folk songs, Burl Ives type songs. I mean, we used to do Blue Tail Fly and stuff like that. Lots of songs, lots of little songs Ellie, you and I would sing together. And then every so often we'd do a little something and I did something by myself. We had a part that we called Get Well Quickers. But if a young person w was ill, had measles, mumps, the flu, or whatever, they would let us know we would call their name on the air and we would sing the Get Well Quicker song and then we would all shout, Get Well Quicker. And so it uh, gave some of the ill young people some, some attention. <laughs> so let the sun shine in, face it with a grin. Smilers never lose and flowers never win. So let the sun shine in. Face it with a grin, open up your heart and let the sun shine in. Then we had a section called the funny phoners. Ellie had an old crank type phone that was on the set. And uh, this was connected directly to the uh, switchboard. So Ellie, he would tell uh, a Mabel, the switchboard operator, what number he wanted and she would plug us in. So we could talk to anybody in the country. Elihu talked to Mr. Green Jeans, who was a sidekick of Captain Kangaroo. And I talked to Audie Murphy on, on the Funny Phoner one time. And I believe uh, Murphy was coming in to be at the Heart of Texas Fair. And, and we interviewed, kind of, it was supposed to be an interview, uh, if you want to call it an interview. Anyway, we talked to him over the phone. And that's my, uh, I guess you'd say that's my best experience with the funny phoners, was talking to Audie Murphy. One day we had uh, Ren 1010 on the show, and Johnny Mac Brown, who was his caretaker on the show, had the handler, and little, the little puppy came along. We had Lord Grey Monkey, which Bryce Armstrong had on his second hand. He had two hands. If he had three hands, we'd have three puppet characters. But he had P.J. on one hand and Lord Grey Monkey on the other. Lord Grey Monkey came into existence because one day during a production meeting, it amazes me we had production meetings since we never formatted anything, really. Uh, one of the uh, gentlemen whose name is now lost to history tossed me a small black monkey puppet and said, see what you can do with this. And I said, well, this is Lord Grey Monkey, of course. I was working on the fact that in the Tarzan books, he actually is Lord Greystoke. And since he was a lord, I gave him an English accent. But because he's a puppet, he became a cockney. So he's, oh, hello, Gav. How's it going? Um, none of the children over the years ever got the reference. They all called him Large Gray Monkey, although he was a small black monkey with the dangling tail, which Ren Tin Tin so obviously adored. But the handler for Ren Tin Tin instructed this big dog to attack this monkey. And so Lord Gray Monkey was in the jaws of Ren Tin Tin in no time. It was very slight, and I don't think Bryce was harmed, but for a while it looked like Lord Gray Monkey was in real danger. But that was an extemporaneous thing. We didn't, we really didn't have too many mishaps. It was fairly carefully well done by the whole staff. We did one thing I'll never forget. I believe it was Bob's idea. It was the most bizarre thing ever in a kid show because we were always very careful and very cautious. Johnny Watkins had a large area behind the station. If you open the huge double metal doors at the end of the station, you can see this large pile of acreage called 10 acres, of course, in which he grew crops every year and uh, had the cameras out there showing this and that and the other piece of equipment, this and that and the other uh, seeds and so on and so forth. One day, Elihu had somebody come running in carrying a bomb. And Elihu leapt up, Wes leapt up. I came running out the door carrying PJ as if I were uh, a courier. The three of us raced out, the camera followed us, 
as we disappeared into the distance at 10 acres, fade to black, and the next day's show starts with a shot of the doors open and three little specks coming closer and closer to the camera. We raced by the camera onto the set. There's a loud explosion, a flash of light, then silence and darkness. Then the camera opens up on the floor, slowly pans up. Wes is draped over the railing. Ella Hughes sprawled back in his chair. And in PJ's window, all you see is my right arm dangling out. <laughs> and then, of course, a Popeye cartoon. <laughs> and when we came back, everything was all right. I don't think any children's program before or since has done something as bizarre as that. The uh, this and that and bacon fat was was a colloquialism almost, but I worked it into the show. And it still remains in Waco. If you go out there at the TV station with some of the old people, they will say this and that and bacon fat, which means I don't know what to call it. So we'll just call it this and that and bacon fat. Young West will tell you we had a Young West secret code with a Possum Grinner's Club card, and the keys were this, that, bacon, and fat. So we would give numbers out each day and let them know what was going to be happening the next day, but they had to have the card to have the code. A girl wrote in, yeah, Wes got a lot of letters from girls in those days, and uh, she said, do you ever have any adventures? So Wes and I said, let's have an adventure. My sister Lucky worked the camera for us. I had an old 60 millimeter Bell and Howell. In those days, it was a new Bell and Howell. We went up to Cameron Park in Waco and shot about two minutes worth of Young West Adventure. We had limited funds. We had no funds. We had to borrow the, the uh, stock film from the station. So Wes, narrating the story, uh, explains that he's following Black Bart, who had robbed the, the bank. And it was getting up into treacherous country and had to leave the horse behind. <laughs> Which means we didn't have to have horses for Black Bart or for Wes. And we see uh, Wes walking through with his uh, cowboy regalia. And Black Bart, an ugly brute of a man, turning and firing a gun at Wes. And I have this 45 looking pistol. May have been a real 45. And I come up over, I pop up over this tree limb or the, the log and I pop up over it and I'm firing the gun and then I duck down. Well, in between the firing and the ducking, the firing and the ducking, that's pretty good. Bryce had a real weapon and he would shoot at the top of that log and the bark would fly off of it. You could tell it was hit by a bullet. Of course, I'm, I'm out of there. And then I'd get back in there and get behind that tree again and I'd pop up and and, and shoot. By the time they edited it, well, it looks like that I'm I'm down behind this log. And somebody's shooting at me, and about the time they, when they, as soon as they had fired, well, then I pop up and I shoot. And there are three or four shots, and Wes knocks the gun from the guy's hand because, like Hopalong Cassidy, Wes would never actually shoot anybody, but he will disarm them. And then uh, Wes proceeds to give the scoundrel the beating of his life. Now, initially, I took some chocolate syrup, this is black and white TV, you recall. And at the last pummeling, I let some chocolate syrup drip down the side of my chin. And Bob was properly dismayed. He said, this is a children's program. We don't bleed on children's programs. So we refilmed the fight. Uh, and then ran it one day with Wes doing the narration, and I had bought a little 22 caliber uh, starter pistol, about yay big. So I fired at the proper time for the shots, and then for the punches. And with Wes's narration, that was the English adventure. And several days later, a 13-year-old girl wrote and said, that was wonderful. I think you should make it into a full motion picture. I got a letter from a girl, some, I must have been from Marlin, or something like Mark, somewhere in that area. And uh, she said something to the effect that well, we really do like you, young Wes. You're real gone, gassed, and groovy. And these people, my, now my wife especially, has, has uh, <laughs> she's teased me about that for years. And ever so often, I will be getting ready to go somewhere. And you know, I'll ask her, I'll say, do you, 
Do you think I look all right? And she said, well, you're real gone, gassed, and groovy. And I said, well, I guess I'm looking okay then. Bob went on a one-week vacation, and Wes and I are there. And this is the closest we ever came to having a plot, I think, on the show. We thought, what are we going to do with Bob? So we got the art department to make us a large cardboard bottle. And we pasted a picture of Ellie on it like this. And then the situation was we couldn't get Ellie out of the bottle. So it would be, help, fellas, help there, uh, yeah. And every so often, we'd be doing something and then cut back to the bottle and Bob would say, now time for another Popeye cartoon. <laughs> yes. So we did this for the week he was gone. At the beginning, we were pretty popular. And so we had to be pretty careful as to what we said and how we said it. And we determined that it would be a family-oriented uh, program to where the, the parents could leave the young kids in front of the TV set and never have to worry about anything being uh, obtrusive or, or unneighborly. We did a lot of funny things that were designed to hook the mamas and papas who may have to watch some kid show with the kid. But if we could toss in something for them, they might prefer us over another. Uh, example was a little boy uh, uh, came up whose name he announced was Milton and P.J. became very agitated and said, Oh, it's just terrible news. Poor Milton has lost the dice from his Monopoly set. Everybody write that down. Milton's paradise lost. This was the sort of thing P.J. was capable of doing. And I think it worked because he was so silly, the kids just saw the silly, and the grown-ups caught the little strange lines. But the little boy came in one day and just so excited to be there, couldn't say anything, so he held up. He was wearing a little dress shirt. He said, PJ, 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 see my cufflinks? And to this day, I think of uh, cufflinks as cufflinks because it's very nice and sweet and uh, <laughs> rite of passage, your first grown up stuff, cufflinks. Well, let's see. Here's a song called uh, I Only Want a Buddy, Not a Sweetheart. Our buddies never make you blue. Sweethearts make vows that are broken, broken like my heart is broken too. Uh, during the show, of course, we had a lot of sponsor participation. And uh, Elihu was basically a commercial character because he understood that if you don't have sponsors, you don't have the support you need for the show. So we had some good sponsors and we worked those into the show to where they became a part of it. One was a Triple X Root Beer. And so we would sing the song, a Triple X Root Beer, Triple X Root Beer, that's the drink for me. Extra goodness, extra flavor, extra quality. Triple X Root Beer, Triple X Root Beer, that's the drink for me. And then we would, of course, drink Triple X on the, on the uh, show. Just about every Triple X Root Beer commercial we did, one of, the, one of the floor crew would hand me a Triple X Root Beer. And Ellie Hugh would say something about, take a, take a swallow of that Young West, or Young West, take a big drink of that root beer and see how good it is, you know, or something like that. So I'd take a drink of it and say, boy, that is good, huh? You know, I love this stuff. Well. Sonny Walker was one of the cameramen. Marvel Rutzel had a kitchen set back over in the other corner with a working refrigerator in it. So we kept this stuff in, kept it cool. We didn't have to drink a hot root beer. Well, every once in a while, Walker would take a cap off of that root beer, pour it out, and fill it full of Dr. Pepper. They put the cap back on. Well, of course, when they come and they came over, handed me the, the soda water, <laughs> the cap was already off. So I take a big drink out of this Triple X root beer, and it's Dr. Pepper. But I couldn't let, and the minute I'm tasting it, I know what's going on. I can't let it show on my face. It's going to ruin the commercial. So they pulled that trick two or three times. 
And uh, I think we got through it every time. I don't, I don't ever remember being reprimanded for, for making a face or saying, oh gosh, that's Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Now the result of that was that Triple X was moved into all of the 7-Eleven stores because people came in wanting Triple X root beer and no other root beer. And so it was a good thing for the sponsor. Another was Wholesome Bread, which was known as Uncle Elihu's Bread because we, uh, we did a lot of that. We said, don't squeeze the wholesome. And we would tell them, don't squeeze that bread. Another was uh, fairly much of a challenge was uh, the, uh, the moving company the Allied Van Lines Company. Now, how are you going to make that appealing to the young people? So we, we said this, if you know of someone who's gonna move in your neighborhood, send us a card and tell us who it is, and we will send you an Allied Van Line agent badge. And this was a little cloth badge that they could put on their shirt or their cap. And we made them an Allied Van Lines agent. Well, the result was, that sponsor knew before any other moving company who was going to move. So they were knocking on the doors first. And it, was, it, it worked out very well. L-I-L-L-Y, Lily Ice Cream's the very best buy. Ice Cream, Mellor and Sherbet too. Lily Ice Cream for me and you. Say, when you go to the grocery store with Mom, be sure that you buy Lily. And let me show you the Lily flavor of the month. It's right in keeping with the season, a delicious flavor blend. It's Lily Dutch Apple. As you can see, it tastes like pie, so give it a try. You'll enjoy the delicious blend of Lily Vanilla Ice Cream with Dutch Apples. Mom will like it and Dad will especially like it too. Be sure that you look for the half-gallon carton when you go to the grocery store with Mom. You can buy it in either ice cream or in melarin. It's Lily Dutch Apple, a real dairy treat by Lily. So be sure and put it on Mom's grocery shopping list. And be sure that you keep your eye out for it when you go to the grocery with grocery store with her. It's Lily Dutch Apple Ice Cream. Oh, L-I-L-L-Y, Lily Ice Cream, the very best buy. Ice Cream, Melorin, Sherbet, too. Lily Ice Cream for me and you. But Lily Ice Cream had its own jingle, and we would work the jingles into the commercials. And uh, so the commercials are really a part of the show. Boys and girls, have Mom and Dad take you to Georgie Chef at 28th and Franklin. Enjoy a delicious meal and get free a menu with my picture on the back, plus a gold coin filled with bubble gum. Remember the name, Georgie Chef. In being involved in the community, we helped with the March of Dimes. We had a map that we put on a big easel. It was a big map. And we traced a trail from Ellie Hughes House to Happy House. And this trail went through several different uh, uh, locations. It went through uh, High Price's General Store, went through uh, Young Wes's Ranch, went through Possum Country, went through around Punk's Pike, not Pike's Peak, but Punk's Pike. Then it went across a rickety bridge, and it, it went by the not-so-grand canyon. And so we, we placed dimes along this trail as they would send them in. And finally, the trail wound up with Happy House. And then we donated all of those dimes, of course, with all the others that we had received, many more than we needed for the map. But we donated those to the March of Dimes. And we uh, had the... Uh, the chairman come out and accept that map and the donations from the show. And so we did various things uh, in the community. We had a, an ice show come into town and uh, we did a remote from the Central Texas uh, Coliseum, if that's what it was called. Uh, but it was one right across the street from the KWTX studio. And I remember they put Elihu inside a line of barrels and this ice skater came around at high speed and Elihu was uh, advised to duck just in time, which he did, and the ice skater went over the barrels and Uncle Elihu. So we did some things like that that were rather fun. We had one day in, uh, at Kittyland, which is right down the street on Bosque Boulevard, 
and we had uh, free rides and free drinks and sponsor prizes and all of that. And we drew, uh, it was estimated about 9,000 9, people and the 6,000 of those were kids. So we had an afternoon of real fun at, at Kittyland. And uh, those were the things that we did to, to keep the show going. We went to uh, the big theater in Fort Hood one Saturday morning and uh, we filled it. And you know, we were really surprised. I think this theater would hold six, 700 people. And here we was over there on a Saturday morning, we had a little portable set that, we, that was just like the set we used on the, on the, tele, on the air. <laughs> we went over there and I know, I know that that thing was full and we did an, about an hour. I think we did about an hour. And uh, folks just loved it. I mean, they loved it. And we were surprised at the amount of people that had showed up. Noticing the fact that one night on the way to a public appearance, personal appearance, Bob is driving, has on the all hue sideburns, doesn't have the mustache or the hat on or the glasses because he, you know, pretend glasses. And I said, Bob, when we do so and so tonight, Bob, Wes, who was always quicker on the uptake than me, said, uh, what's the plan tonight, Ellie Hugh? Oh, well, fellas, we're gonna... Because once Bob was even in partial makeup, he never left the character. He was not ever gonna take the chance of some little kid being disillusioned by hearing the wrong voice come out of all you. He stayed in character forever. After a while, we kind of uh, become... We kind of uh, were becoming thin on script it, we, all, we didn't have a staff writing what we were doing. Uh, we were ad-libbing everything that we did uh, with a very basic outline to go on. And so finally, I determined, well, uh, Elihu either has to move to another community or we're going to have to take the show off the air. And uh, the latter is what we chose to do. So we concluded the Elihu show on, on one afternoon and uh, it was it's kind of a sad day for all, but those, those things happen, especially in TV and in radio. The whole experience was something that uh, uh, I'm just not, uh, I'm, I'm never going to forget it. None I know these guys won't either. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. So until tomorrow, this is P.J. Possum and Young Wes and Uncle Elihu saying, see you in the funny papers. Well, let's say uh, thank you to this Waco crew for coming down to uh, film this interview. That yes. was very lovely. Thank you. Yes, we, yes. we have with us, we have uh, Larry... Uh, uh, Hosey. Hosey, and we have Mark Randolph. And uh, the two of them have come down to uh, help us put on this uh, show. They put us on film and or tape. We appreciate or that. And I want to say in passing, I appreciate Bryce driving 300 miles. I must be exhausted. For that. <laughs> and Young West driving 200 miles for this. So did Larry. And so, yeah, and uh, Larry Hosey driving 200 miles. Larry's important. And Tim, my son, drove 200 miles. Yay, Tim. So uh, we're, we appreciate all of that. And uh, please uh, give our thanks to the city of Waco for allowing you to come down and do this. And if we've left anybody out, we're covered with room. Messy <laughs> stuff, there. <laughs> <laughs>